All right, um, so that's my heading. I don't need to introduce that again, so we can go to the next slide. Um, my name is Ben. I'm a UREX researcher at Epic Games. I have a PhD in psychology. It's in human factors, where I specialized in road safety. And I'm a Kiwi, which means I'm furry on the outside and sour on the in inside. <laughs> um, you can contact me at uh, benlow7 at epicgames.com uh, or on Twitter. I also like to play games, so please reach out to me on these services and add me. As I said, I used to also work in road safety. And road safety is an area where psychology and human factors has a long history. And that's for one uh, basic reason. And that is that road traffic accidents are the number one leading cause of death uh, for young people worldwide. And in fact, there's nearly no job that you can do, including being in the military, that's more risky than just driving to work in the morning. So this is an area where understanding how uh, people operate and people behave, and improving behaviors is really important. Uh, and one example of this with human factors psychology is Vision Zero. This is put forward by the Swedish government with a goal to reduce traffic accidents to zero. This is a scientific but also philosophical statement that they make, that they believe that no system that people pay for, roads, via taxes, should kill the people paying for it. So when you work in road safety, uh, there are three E's you can use when uh, looking at different interventions to take. And those can be education, here's a road sign in New Zealand. Enforcement, here's a New Zealand police tractor. <laughs> and engineering, and here's a, a rope median barrier in the middle of the road. And this solution, engineering, uh, just adding this median barrier can reduce traffic fatalities on a piece of road by 50%. Because what engineering does is it means that uh, accidents simply can't happen because head-on collisions, which are very dangerous, can't happen. And I'm going to propose we can use those same three E's to look at the problem of people being antisocial in games. Before I do that, we've already heard a little bit about this today. But why should we improve it? Well, our players want to have a good time. Being uh, abused is not a good time. We want to build more inclusive communities, larger communities. We want more people to play our games. So our games retain better. And of course, for the business people, so we make more money. So let's get into that. Education. I'm not going to spend much time on education. You'll see why. But there's different ways of doing this. Uh, basic education can be a code of conduct. This is the Paragon code of conduct. It exists on our website, which is it, that means it exists. It's not possibly the best place for it, but what it does is it does establish some guidelines for our community that we can point to. Perhaps more effective uh, is loading screen tips. These appear as you're actually in the game, before you're about to do the behaviors that we want you to uh, influence. And here's an example of one. 10 minus 1 is no fun. Stay in the fight. It rhymes. I like it. And there's a bunch of these that, we've, that we put up. But really, that's all I want to talk about with education, because while it's easy to do, it is mostly ineffective. Uh, a lot of people think about education as very valuable. However, in road safety, and I also feel in this area, it does not have a lot to contribute if you want to seriously tackle the problem. It is very easy to do, which is a positive. It's very low cost. And the community will generally react well to educational methods initially. If they're not backed up by something else, that can turn. It is best when delivered close to the relevant behavior. So the loading screen tips are close to the activity the person's about to do. So it's in mind as they go through that activity, whereas the code of conduct we've got sitting on the website uh, is kind of out of sight, out of mind. One good thing that education does do is establish standards and supports other initiative. Research is really clear on this from road safety, where an enforcement effort or an engineering effort can have its impact boosted by an education effort coming alongside of it. If you just do education, not very effective, but if you combine it with other methods, it can uh, increase those other methods. Ultimately, though, even though we like to believe that it does, awareness and knowledge does not usually result in behavior change just by itself. And that is because there's a lot of other things that can get in the way and a lot of other incentives that are set up. So moving on to enforcement. Enforcement is what a lot of people think about in this area. They think about banning people, punishing bad actors, this kind of thing. And what we actually want to do with enforcement is we want to get deterrence. We want people not just to be punished for bad behavior, but we want them to feel like there's a possibility they get punished for bad behavior 
and therefore they don't do that behavior in the future. And when we talk about deterrence, there's lots of classical theories about this. Um, the biggest one says what's important for deterrence is certainty, that it's certain you will be caught every time you do the behavior, followed by the swiftness of the punishment. So as soon as you're caught, you receive a punishment, swift feedback. And then the final aspect is severity. I've made severity very little small here because it's actually the least important component. And this is a big problem in road safety because swiftness and certainty are hard to do without setting up a police state or something like that. Whereas you can mess with severity very easily. However, in games, we control the system in which people are operating. So through automating systems, we can actually have high certainty and swiftness, and we don't have to mess around with severity, which is much less effective. So some examples of this. Um, when you're giving certain feedback, you need to make sure that it goes to offenders, that they know uh, what's happened. League has one way of doing it. This is another example of, of Dota's approach. What this system does is it's trying to let the offender know that something's happened, give them feedback that there could be further punishment in the future, it tells them they've had six reports. Importantly, it says that those reports have come in over three games from four different parties to let them know this is not just someone beating up on you. And also, it's trying to tell them that it's not normal by saying that 94% of other players don't get this many reports. So this type of behavior is not normal. It's not what's normally happening in the population. And just as a quick aside, in Paragon, uh, this is kind of a, Paragon's our MOBA at Epic and it's on PC and PS4. And this is kind of a, an example of learning to think about the structures of your game. We have an AFK problem, MOBAs tend to have AFK issues. And we found on PS4 it was slightly worse. And we wondered why that was. And we found out that, or at least we feel that one of the issues is that the way that players go AFK on PS4 is they just turn the PlayStation off. It's a very console problem, they just shut everything down. And that means they weren't getting our warning messages because we delivered our warning messages after you, t after you quit the game, like a PC player would just select quit. So we move to a system now where instead of it occurring afterwards, it occurs when you next go to queue up. So you next try to play, that's where you get a warning or that's where you get your penalty. So uh, it's just a small change, but it, it was interesting. In addition to giving feedback to offenders, it's really important that you also give feedback to uh, reporters. Here's an example from Paragon. Um, if you report somebody in Paragon and we take action, you get this pop-up. It's got Lieutenant Bellica on it, who's a police officer in our universe, and she's thanking you for helping out catch an offender and that you're helping keep Paragon a friendly place. And this kind of feedback, it helps with deterrence because it obviously gives the single that there's action out there. It helps reporters have trust in the system because if they just report and report and report and they never see any impact because they still see toxic people in their games, they still see antisocial people in their games, then they lose faith in the system and stop using it. Also, it's got a kind of nice um, social aspect to it. Quite often someone will share this on Twitter or on um, Reddit and say, it feels really good to get this message. I know that somebody uh, has been actioned. Now, when we talk about enforcement, there are some downsides to consider. Uh, if you have to rely on player report, it's slow, and that hurts the certainty and swiftness uh, part. You have to worry about false positives, or at least the perception of, and I feel it is often much more of perception of in the community, and that's because usually uh, us as designers are very cautious about false positives, and a lot of punishment systems are designed conservatively to avoid them. But people will, of course, claim they're being falsely, uh, falsely found, and it can become a, a big issue in the community if you're not careful about it. There can be difficult behaviors in MOBAs such as uh, Paragon, there's sabotage, where you purposely try and make your team lose by dying to the enemy or doing things like that. And those can be hard to define. How do you identify what sabotage versus just somebody's not a particularly good player or having a bad day? And you can look for patterns of behavior, of course, but then that slows down detection. For a company that's running free-to-play games, of course, there's the chance that punishment breeds resentment and avoidance. People don't like being punished. They may leave your game if they're being punished. In some ways, that's okay if you don't want them around anymore. Punishment tends to only teach what not to do, not what to do, and that's a problem. You want to be 
helping your uh, players work out what they should be doing. And it does tend to focus on repeat offenders, whereas, as said earlier, most offenders are actually just once off having a bad day. Enforcement uh, works on catching people. All right, you've seen this one already, but my one moves. Um, here's an example <laughs> of positive feedback from Riot. This is, of course, not quite enforcement, but it's a good time to introduce a system where you give positive feedback to encourage uh, positive behavior. And again, I have this same slide, which also moves, of the feedback going to the player and letting them know immediate feedback on positive behavior. This is a very good system, a very positive system. It's got a lot of nice elements to it, as you've already heard. To give a different example, here's uh, Dota's uh, version of it, where they're, they're a little bit more simple, where they're just saying that this player's got less than three reports, they've got four commands, and they're a positive person. It's me, because I'm lovely. <laughs> All right. Enforcement engineering, those kind of positive things are actually kind of more of an engineering thing than an enforcement thing, but they flow well on from enforcement, so it can be interesting to talk about them. And in road safety, some people have argued it should be the four E's, which would be uh, education, enforcement, encouragement, and engineering, but it's not well established. Engineering is otherwise known as design. It's a systems view. It's the most effective thing you can do in road safety, and I feel, in this area. It's where UX can have the most impact, and it's simply to acknowledge the impact the design has on player behavior and understand how design can be altered to change this. So what's some examples of this? The first one that obviously jumps to mind is communication systems. Now, game developers often have a very positive view of commu communication systems. We heard just in the previous one, and open encouragement to put a global chat in your game. And this is because um, game developers tend to experience the positive side of communication. We tend to have gaming friends. We tend to have good communities. We acknowledge how important social is to keeping people in our games. There's a lot of positivity here. But how do players use communication? And specifically, I want to focus on voice chat, because it's an interesting area. And we've got some data on that. We don't have voice chat at the moment in any of our games. And we asked our Paragon players how they typically use voice chat and the importance of it. And we asked them to rate it for friends and family, strangers who are teammates, and strangers who are enemies. And the result here is, is, is relatively interesting in that people value voice chat very strongly to talk with their friends and their family. When it's to talk to strangers who are teammates, they're kind of split. The majority don't value it very much, but there is a, a decent amount that do value it. And it, when it comes to talking to enemies, uh, people are not particularly uh, interested in that. They don't have a lot of value to it for voice chat. And when we ask them, how do you actually use it instead of uh, value? It's very similar for friends and family. But what you see for strangers and teammates is that even though more people said they valued it, less people use it to actually talk with strangers and teammates. And then with enemies, it, it, it's very similar. And so we had a follow-up question on this where we were asking, so how do you actually use voice chat? And what we found is, in line with the previous data, most of our players on PC and on console were using third-party solutions for voice chat, so Discord, that kind of thing, or the built-in uh, team chat. And this lines up with the data we've got from the previous slides, where mostly they're talking with friends and family. That's easy to do through third-party. There is a significant number that use um, in-game, so it's not, uh, not valuable to have. But this was interesting data. And then kind of moving on to the idea of open chat between everybody, there's been experiments and, and design solutions in games in the past that have looked at this. So League at one point had uh, all chat that's chat between the two teams on by default. And they changed so you had to opt into it rather than everybody being put in a channel all at once. And what they found is this reduced uh, negative behavior. Um, but it kept the volume of chat quite the same. So you had the benefit of people talking and still communicating, but the toxicity uh, reduced somewhat because people had to opt in. They had to choose to join a channel. It wasn't just something that was forced upon them. And this can be important because even if there's a small amount of toxicity in a big general channel, that can become the norm. It can become, this is OK. You don't see the people getting punished for it, and this kind of negativity goes around. And it's more than just Riot that's done this. Destiny, a very big, popular game, launched with no voice chat whatsoever. 
and then when they edited it in, and they've continued this in Destiny 2, it's opt-in. It's not you're automatically joined. It's very clearly signaled with good UX. It pops up and it says you can opt in right now. It lets you know when someone has opted in. And it tries to encourage you to join, but ultimately it's up to you to make this choice. It is not a communication channel that is just open. You can also look at automatic communication by design. Uh, there's lots of games that do this now. Uh, Halo 5 was an interesting example of it, where what they try and do is they know a lot of people won't be using uh, voice chat to talk with strangers. So they have the avatars that you play during multiplayer actually act like good teammates. So they'll call out when they spot enemies, they'll call out weapon locations, they'll do all this stuff kind of just programmatically and automatically without the players having to do it to encourage them into the same habits as if they were on voice chat, the positive habits, the positive habits of communication and teamwork. And a lot of these things are to think about competition and cooperation in games. We really like competition in games. And it's great, it's a great motivator, especially for those who think they can win. However, it does promote conflict, and we need to be careful about that, especially when we design uh, situations that are winner takes all, loser gets nothing. In Destiny 1, they had the Iron Banner for the first time round, and they found out, and there was no reward for losing. So a lot of people, as soon as it looked like their team was losing, would just abandon the game. This is a problem. So when they brought it round again, they added in, uh, you get a little reward for losing, and then it builds up into a larger reward over time. Similarly, if we look at cooperation, one of the big things about cooperation is it makes people cooperate. That's why it's called that. Um, <laughs> a good example in Destiny 2 is their clan system. The clan system's nice. You work together as a clan. And if you're a hardcore raider, you get benefits from being in the clan from your casual players leveling it up. If you're a casual player, your hardcore players are getting you benefits uh, by playing the game the way that they like. Another thing you can look at in terms of your design is how your matchmaking works. Um, this is an example from Overwatch, and I would actually say that this is almost more of an educational thing, but it's telling you uh, too many of a certain enemy, no builder, no tank heroes, giving you a little bit of guidance to build a, a, a good team. However, this kind of approach can lead to conflict because say you're the last person to pick and there's a very clear message on the screen from the developer telling you what type of hero you should pick, but you really don't want to play that hero. That's a lot of social pressure. The developer's giving a message that you should be doing one thing and maybe you're not. So personally, I think a, a, a more effective step is what Riot does in League, where when you queue in their game uh, through this queue, you can select what role you want to play and a primary and a secondary role ahead of time, and it tries to match you with other people with um, roles that will help support you. And then when you go into the draft, you're all set in your roles, and you pick one by one to try and remove a lot of conflict over who's going to play what, who's going to play what role. That can mean that the game gets off to a bad start right away. Destiny 2 is trying this in some way with their guided games, where clans can help people who are not members of clans through some of the harder activities. I'm interested to see how this has worked out for them. Outside of matchmaking, you can look at ways that are similar. Uh, Destiny's clan is an example of this, but shared rewards, boosts, uh, positive externalities tied to monetization even. So for example, in Game of War Fire Age, when you monetize in the game, everybody in your clan benefits. And when you benefit from somebody doing something, you like to do nice things back to them too. Um, similarly in Paragon, when you buy a hero mastery we have, Everyone on your team benefits from playing with you if they have a hero mastery and these add up together. So it's not just, I make a monetization purchase that just helps me. It's, I make a purchase that helps me and it helps others. And then in Fortnite, this is not monetized, but it is an example of this, where when you use boosts, they help other people that you play along with. It's kind of to get a circle of helping. Instant loot is an obvious design example here where loot only drops for the person who sees it rather than for everybody. This is again reducing competition. There's no resource to compete against. In Fortnite, this happens after certain events. These parcels pop out and they're only for the specific people. And of course, Diablo and other games also use this approach. And then finally wrapping up, I don't have a lot of time, 
there's a lot more of these things, but there are mechanical things you can do just to encourage cooperation and encourage positive play. This has to be something, if you are serious about it, that you think about throughout your design, just like UX. It can't be something that's added at the end to prevent negative behavior. So just as an example, the difference between this and this in promoting team play is quite large. And we use a similar thing in Paragon where you can look through the 3D world and you can see outlines of your allies and enemies if they're in, in vision. And if this information wasn't there, there'd be less teamwork. Another interesting example of this is the passive helping that happens in Destiny via, via their super system. In Destiny, you have a super that you build up over time. And when you use your super ability, a bunch of little orbs drop out depending on how well you use it. And these orbs can be picked up by other people, and that boosts their super. So even if you're the most selfish player in the world that never wants to help anybody else, as long as you're using your super, you're helping other people. And they know you're helping them. They're aware of why you're helping them. And these systems are just built into the game to encourage positive team play. So again, I could say a lot more about this, but in summary, negative behaviors are a problem for games and for our players, and therefore for us. Player behavior is shaped by design. Uh, game design and UX can unintentionally encourage negative behavior. I'm not saying that designers go out there to have negative behavior, but if it's not thought about during the design process, it can occur. For example, in a lot of games that are team games, such as MOBAs or first-person shooters with defend the flag modes or whatever, we glorify getting kills and then we hardly reward at all defending or playing a defensive role or supporting others. It's all about your kill-death ratio. It's all about getting the announcer to be shouting your name. And is this positive? It helps in some ways, but we have to identify where it could be negative. So ultimately, we have the power to reduce negative behavior and encourage positive via our design. And I want to submit uh, my vision zero of people being nice to each other online. Again, like reducing traffic deaths to zero, maybe this never happens, but I do think it's a goal that's worth working towards. So thank you very much. <laughs>